She's leveraging the best of Silicon Valley to create a 21st century workers union. Let's welcome Carmen Rojas, founder and CEO of Workers Lab, and Aki Ito, Bloomberg tech editor to the stage. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Aki Ito. I'm a tech editor with Bloomberg here in San Francisco. Uh, I host a documentary series about uh, the future of work. It's called Next Jobs. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about this topic that we're about to discuss today. Um, I'm so excited to introduce to you Carmen Rojas, CEO of the Workers Lab. Carmen's been doing some amazing work um, with a group of people here in Silicon Valley who we often overlook, I think. Um, before we get to that, though, um, I'm going to take maybe about five minutes for audience Q&A at the very end, so you can start thinking about the kinds of questions that you'd like to ask Carmen today at the end of the session. Uh, so, Carmen, welcome. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you. This is like a dream scenario to come out to Rihanna's work. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Um, maybe we can start off by uh, hearing a little bit about the Workers Lab. What was the genesis? Sure. Um, so, thanks so much for having me here. The Workers Lab is a lab that invests in innovations and experiments that build power for working people in the 21st century economy. And the genesis for me, um, what really motivated me to start the organization and to take on the issue of work in the United States uh, was my mom. Uh, she immigrated to San Francisco in the 60s, uh, second eldest of 17 kids, um, and worked cleaning office buildings. And a couple of months in, got offered a job at one of the office buildings, and that job was for a big multinational bank. Um, and at that time, that bank offered her a no-interest loan to buy her first home in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So it offered an entry-level worker with a middle school education a no-interest loan to be able to stay in the city that she worked in because that's um, the values that they had as a company to tether their fate with working people. And as I grew up, I always knew that I benefited from this one moment in time, right? That uh, my mom was really lucky. And I was able to go to great public schools, went to graduate school, but kept seeing my nieces and nephews, um, my younger cousins struggle a lot harder. Here in the Bay Area. Here in the Bay Area. And it was mostly because they didn't come in this random moment in time when workers and companies, there, was a, there wasn't alignment, right? My mom benefited. She came at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. She came at peak labor organizing. So even though she wasn't a member of a union, she came at a moment when uh, our democracy uh, and uh, our society that we believed in the public good, that we um, had created a tie with each other and knew that if you were well, then I would be well as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I really just refuse to be the last generation of people that gets to benefit from that moment in time. And so the Workers Lab uh, really is an expression of that, um, a desire to want more, a mm. deep belief that if you work in this country, that you should be able to feed your kids, that you should be able to pay your rent, that you should be able to save to buy a home, uh, that these should not be impossible choices. And instead, like it should be absurd that we have the language of the working poor in the richest country in the world. And so we set out to support these innovations and experiments that demonstrated to the private sector, to the public sector, to leaders in the uh, nonprofit sector and philanthropy, that we could actually have thriving businesses while also doing right by working people. And it's co-founded by the SEIU. Is that's that right. right. One of that's the right. biggest yeah, unions, that's right. labor unions in that's the world. That's right. Yeah. Um, so the Service Employees International Union. Uh, set off on this journey about five years ago uh, to figure out what the future of worker organizing was going to be. And collective bargaining was the historical method by which uh, workers were organized in the economy. But they also knew that there were so many other ways that were often left on the table, things like employee stock ownership programs, cooperatives, um, 
things like, you know, like the presentation before the last presentation where workers are actually just able to report the conditions that they're experiencing in the workplace directly and easy and without retaliation um, to help make the place to spend the vast majority of their time uh, easier and better. And so the Workers Lab is an investment from SEIU. So they gave us our first startup capital. We are the nation's first uh, lab, uh, labor-funded lab. Hmm. Yeah. And so the goal is similar, improving the lives of the working class, but the methods are a little different. It's not a traditional trade union. That's exactly right. So what we've set out to do is to say unions have perfected collective bargaining and there are uh, benefits and constraints to collective bargaining, right? So there's always a tension between capital and labor in collective bargaining. There is uh, a contract that's regulated by government in collective, gar in collective bargaining. Uh, what we sought to do is to figure out what else existed. Mm -hmm. So for example, our biggest project last year, we had the 10th largest agricultural company in the country approach us because there was a labor shortage. Um, it was really hard to have have work to find workers to come and pick grapes on their fields. And the way that uh, agricultural work is organized, it's like, it's like the original gig work, right? It's contract work. And so they were dependent on all these small contractors to bring workers to the fields. And what we found was like, actually, let's just change the whole business model. Let's change this contracting model. And started a company called the California Harvesters. When it launched, it's in a, uh, I would think about it as like a labor cooperative that's owned by agricultural workers, overwhelmingly immigrant, uh, a good number of undocumented workers. Mm -hmm. This last year, we ended the season, they made just over $11 million, and most importantly, 900 workers saw an increase in wages for the first time ever, had access to full-time benefits, full benefits for them and their families, wow. um, had ways to report things like sexual harassment um, and misconduct in the, work, in the workplace. And what we've heard from workers is that the thing that they've really appreciated the most is knowing every week that they're going to, they're going to get paid and how much they're going to get paid. So on the one side, we solved a problem for a business that needed workers. And on the other side, we figured out how to build a business model that could live in relationship with growers and thrive. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people here in Silicon Valley would see organized labor as something that's maybe a thing of the past, a little outdated, perhaps resisting change. Why are they wrong? Um, I think that we have... Uh, in Silicon Valley, I think that we have like a weird misconception of like entrepreneurship as like the best way to improve the lives of working people. And so this happens a lot in like, uh, as a Latina, like it happens a lot in like the immigrant narrative, like, oh, it's really amazing uh, that there are Latina bodega owners, Latina dry cleaner owners. One of the things that we often miss is that people go into entrepreneurship, the vast majority of people go into entrepreneurship really because of failures in the labor market, right? Like the jobs aren't good for the vast majority of people. And I think we... So they have to go out and... That's right. They're create like... their own job. That's exactly right. And they're often as poor, having kids work uh, in their businesses. But somehow that feels more... Uh, Dignified. I feel like the labor movement, mm -hmm. at its peak, brought parity in wages. It was peak. Uh, it was peak democratic participation in this country. I think the labor movement, in and of itself, uh, is such an important catalyst to actually check the economy uh, and remind democracy that it's the job of democracy to manage an economy in service of the public good and not the other way around. Uh, and I feel like we're living in a moment where we have both the l some of the lowest union membership ever and are experiencing the greatest inequality ever. Mm -hmm. And I think that those things aren't disconnected from the decline of labor unions in this country. Right. It does feel like something is changing right now, though. It must be an exciting time politically with the rise of um, powerful advocates of the working class, like uh, Congressman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. How are you seeing that, kind of the shifts in the political tides? Yeah, um, I am really excited. I mean, the fact that we are, one, talking about government again, right? That even as progressives, I feel like we have surrendered the role of government and the role that government plays in making people's lives better, <laughs> right? Like, uh, 
that we, for the longest time, had people saying, take your hands off my Medicaid, you know, like my Medicaid or my Social Security, as if those are not not public goods. This shining the uh, light on the role that government plays and the fact that it's a people's government, right? That uh, at its best, our democracy is an expression of the needs and the dreams and the desires of the people who live here. And I feel like this new crop of political representatives are shining a light on that. I also think it's just um, an, an opportunity just to fight for what we want and not just what we can get. Right, so I, um, again, co-founded in partnership with SEIU. The Fight for 15 is a big part of SEIU's work. And that's not enough in most places in this country. And so that's what is... A, that's to raise the minimum. That's right, just to $15 mm -hmm. an hour. You can't, as an individual person, you can't live in San Francisco making $15 an hour. And somehow, like, our aspirations have been stunted to what's politically feasible right. and not what's... Um, actually going to allow people to live lives of dignity, people who work every day. And so I'm excited that the discourse is about uh, expanding the aperture to, actual, to what's actually needed mm -hmm. and not like uh, reconciling or surrendering to what we can win piecemeal. Mm -hmm. You know, one of um, the big things that we've been reporting on at Bloomberg is the conditions of the gig economy workers, the, the Uber drivers, uh, the Postmate bike messengers, the TaskRabbit furniture assemblers, and the conditions that they work in, the lack of benefits that they have. There's some really interesting stuff going on at the courts right now about yeah. how they're classified too. How do you see that playing out? Yeah. Um so I think about it situationally. So gig workers for our tech companies represent less than 1% of the total contract workers, mm. right? So there are people like agricultural workers, janitorial service workers that have been the original, all kinds of workers who have been on contract uh, for the l longest time and just aren't um, as reportable uh, <laughs> or as easy to see as the Uber. We don't want to see them. Maybe I'll say it that way, as easy as we want to see the Uber driver. So I try to situate the gig economy in this larger context. And I think that gig workers are the canary in the coal mine, right? Like we are starting to see uh, a move to try to shift W-2 work into contract work under the guise of flexibility without actually um, reconciling or talking about the things that workers need to give up the moment they become contract workers for this greater flexibility, right? Um, I have been really, uh, frankly, like grateful that we can actually have a conversation about the rise of contract work more broadly. Mm. And I'm nervous that like the, like the techification of contract work through the gig economy helps us forget, again, the, the everyday contract workers that we engage, we've always engaged with, that haven't been as like uh, politically palatable uh, or visually palatable because they're mostly black and immigrant. Mm. Um, and now we have an opportunity to really shine a light on this, like, contract work more broadly. Right. Speaking of which, Google just announced that uh, they're going to be requiring all of their contractors to be given certain benefits. Yeah. Um, those are not gig economy workers, more traditional contract yeah. workers. Uh, how, what do, you, what do you make of that? I think it's amazing, right? So, like, Google has 30,000 employees, uh, uh, of those uh, 30,000 full-time employees, mm -hmm. they have just as many contractors that right. they have access to. And so imagine- I was like, surprised when I saw that Yeah, number. No, it's yeah. A lot of contractors. It's overwhelmingly contractors. I think that there's a way in which Google can set a standard for the Valley of what uh, employer responsibility is when they think about procurement and having contracts with people, mm -hmm. right? I do have, um, uh, I wonder who else will take up that charge, yeah. right? Like, I mean, that was interesting, right? Because that was driven mostly by employee protests. That's right. I, well, I mean, I think the Tech Workers Coalition, there are a bunch of uh, two or three pretty amazing groups of tech workers on the technical side who have uh, sort of made it their work to put pressure on their company to do better. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we've seen that 
with worker conditions, so at Facebook and the bus drivers, here at Google, we're seeing it around things like uh, the ways that the government is partnering with contracting companies around immigration enforcement. It's been such a powerful, I think, moment to think about workers uh, in a new organizational form that's not a traditional labor movement, holding their companies accountable for the public good. Hmm. Yeah. Mm, that's very interesting. You know, one thing that's been really important to me as I've been reporting my docu-series, which profiles people in jobs that didn't exist a generation ago, is making sure that we profile some jobs that don't necessarily require, like, a PhD in computer science. That's right. um, but it's also undeniable that uh, the less uh, specialized jobs, the jobs that require less education, are at a greater risk of getting automated. And I'm wondering if, you know, maybe that's like a little bit, a little further into the future, but is that something that you think about in your role? Um, uh, like I'm a, I'm a rise of the robot skeptic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am, uh, I am like, I think about my mom who's now in her 70s and uh, the idea of a robot caring for my mom. So I think about care jobs. Mm -hmm. That's just not going to happen. Like We did do an episode <laughs> about that, actually. Yeah, <laughs> but who is likely to do that? Like, right. um, Are the vast majority of parents likely to let a robot care for their children? I think that when we think about the total number of jobs in our economy uh, that are sort of socials that are service sector jobs, low wage jobs, and that require person to person interaction. Um, I just, it's not something that's front of mind for me. And working again with California Harvesters on this agricultural project, what's been interesting is that it's actually really difficult to automate things like, you know, picking grapes. We right. think about that as low skilled work, but that's a choice that we've made. That's very skilled work. You can't like pick somebody from a crowd and be like, oh, pick, 10 cases of grapes that are perfect to put in a market. No, that's mm -hmm. like that's skilled work that we have as a society decided to undervalue and underpay. And I feel like we have a moment, this is the political moment, to actually set that right mm -hmm. and actually pay people for working, uh, regardless of what they do. Yeah. Well, bringing this back to Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, she made a really interesting speech the other week that we just talked about yeah. in the green room down there. Um, and what she said was, we should not be haunted by the specter of being automated out of work, but the reason we're not excited by it is because we live in a society where if you don't have a job, you are left to die. And that at its core is our problem. What do you make of that? You know, we have, we're, it, we're in a funny place because we're a worker organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I, over the last year, we've been running this design sprint, and it's, it's been focused on getting working people $1,000 when they need it. Because right now, the only option is payday lending. You pay an exorbitant amount of money to get this $1,000, or you, it's like a cliff into deep poverty. So you lose your Metro card, your car breaks down, your kid gets sick. It's impossible to make your way out of that. So we raise money, we're like, what is the easiest way to get people this $1,000? And on this journey, there were a couple of things that have become really clear to me. One is that the vast majority of people who are doing things like retiring end up coming back to work because they can't afford to stay retired. Hmm. Two, Social security yeah, isn't enough. It just never un it's just not enough. Mm -hmm. um, two, that there's uh, a way in which people feel abandoned, like this thing about... Uh, you, you're left to die, people actually feel that. So when we started like testing out the language of the free thousand dollars, people were like, are you crazy? You're just gonna give me a thousand dollars for nothing? Mm -hmm. This is uh, crazy. Uh, they didn't believe that anybody had their back. Mm -hmm. And it's pushed me as somebody who runs a worker organization to think about the social safety net more broadly. And so I think she's absolutely right that we need to think about the set of benefits that people need to be. Like what are the benefits for being that we need to have in place for free for people to live lives of dignity, to be able to move across the economy with ease and without feeling penalty so that they can uh, imagine a life for themselves and for their families um, that isn't tethered to, to poverty. And that's how it is now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree. And I think for us as an organization, we're trying to figure out like, uh, 
what is the lattice? Like, what is it, how do we weave together um, an infrastructure that allows people to make mistakes? Not only really rich people to make mistakes, but poor people to make mistakes without having to pay humongous penalties. Mm. What are the, what's the lattice that allows you to go to school for free to learn something without having an exorbitant amount of debt on your back after you do that? What's the lattice that exists for you to get sick or for me to get sick or for our kids to get sick without having to make these impossible choices between medicine and rent, which the half of working people in this country earn less than $15 an hour. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, people here in the audience today, I think we have some investors, some entrepreneurs, some uh, tech company employees. If they're inspired today by the work that you've been doing, how can they get involved? Yeah, sure. Um, so you're going to find us on the internet because we're, uh, we're on the internet. Um, it's a workerslab.com. Um, I, you know, I really love the work that Forward does mostly because it sits at this intersection or at this cusp between uh, a tech environment that is so ambitious and future looking. Uh, and I love being able to present here mostly because I, I want to make sure that that future looking is grounded and standing in today. Uh, and I'm so excited really to be in a room of people who are grounded, who are standing in today's, trying to solve today's problems with the ambition of the future. <laughs> um, and so I invite folks to reach out. Like we have an innovation fund twice a year. Uh, we give folks $150,000 for 12 months to try something new. Uh, our next one opens in June. It's broad, so it's focused on new ways to build power for working people. Um, and we are uh, really excited to be in this conversation and in partnership. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, we have three and a half minutes left. I'd like to open it up to the audience for anyone who has a question for Carmen. Hi, Carmen. Thanks so much. I'm Jesse Tang, for sure, full-time MBA at Berkeley Haas. I used to work at a workforce development nonprofit. Um, there's been a lot of buzz around universal basic income, especially in the Valley, and I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on, on that and whether yeah. it would actually work. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it would work. Um, I, uh, like the robots, I'm a skeptic. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I am a Whether it would actually help people? Um, whether the, the government enough. would actually end up doing it? Uh, uh, both things. Okay. Uh, and maybe a third thing, and the third thing is the thing that really bothers me the most, right? Like, the source of the universal basic income uh, of the conversation in, the Silicon, in Silicon Valley is mostly uh, what isn't said is the government programs that provide people things like food stamps, like Medicaid, like Medicare, um, that provide what little tattered benefits that people get today uh, are ineffective, so I'd rather give you $1,000. Um, so that's one thing that's like a signal for me that uh, we're not talking about. The other thing is that I worry that we have a long history of doing that, and then what happens is that we give everybody $1,000 and are like, you're poor, you just made a bunch of bad choices with your $1,000. It's too bad that you can't go through to a free K through 12 school because they no longer exist because you had your $1,000. I feel like we have figured a way, a way to like financialize these things that should just be a part of the public good. And what's unnerving to me about the conversation in the Silicon Valley about UBI is that, that like the, the state is inherently a failed actor. Um, and I, I mean, we were talking about this in the back. Like, I feel like as a progressive, we've often pushed a conversation about the failures of government. That's why we have like a proliferating, a growing nonprofit sector. I think we're in the moment where we need to reclaim that. You're like, this is our government, uh, and need to actually insert into the conversation the things that we want government to do and the places that we want government, we want to hold government accountable for failing us and for failing our families and for failing our people. And we're not doing that. And I feel like UBI is like a distraction, like a, for me at least, a distraction in that conversation. Mm. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, yeah. The woman there. 
I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you just speak up? Sorry, I I've been asking um, a lot of questions today. Thank you so much for your comments. But maybe you can speak to, are, are you doing any work around holding some of these companies accountable for job automation and what that's gonna look like for our communities? Because I don't think people are really understanding that you know, in our communities, lack of a job is directly connected to child abuse rates in certain communities, crime rates, homicide rates, et cetera. And I see a lot of these tech companies talking about, oh, diversity and inclusion, and this topic is not included. And usually those jobs that are automated are jobs that poor people of color have. Yeah. So. Um, I try to stay off as far as, when this, like, I'm probably not going to be popular with this audience, but like, well, I'm here on this stage. And <laughs> um, uh, I try to stay as far away from the DEI conversation as possible because I feel like it's uh, a red herring. It, it feels like a fake conversation. Like, I want a racial and economic justice conversation. I believe that black people, specifically in this country, uh, have borne the brunt of white supremacy, failed government policies, an economy that was never meant for them, for it to work for them. And I was just saying to Aki, like, uh, our forefathers never imagined somebody that looks like her and somebody that looks like me sitting on a stage like this talking about the future of work. And so our opportunity, I think, is to like push on the boundary of that conversation and instead of um, getting obsessed of like, the one black woman who's going to overwhelmingly get uh, hired to run diversity and inclusion at one tech company and then leave after six months because it's an impossible place to work, actually get to the heart of why venture capitalists keep giving money to those companies. Get to the heart of why government actually isn't stepping in and saying we have to diversify boards, not just by gender, but also by race. Um, I think that there's a, a richer conversation to be had. And uh, like I have the privilege to run an organization that lets me sit in that space. Mm. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, Carmen, thank you no, so much thank for you, today. Thank you, Aki. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thank oh. you.